This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture and I'm here with Brian Crane. Today we're speaking with Gil Binder and Yair Klepper, co-founders and respectively CTO and CEO at Lava Network. Lava is an innovative project that aims to decentralize data provisioning for blockchains. I like to call it Uber for blockchain data. And so we're gonna be diving deep into Lava today and understanding how it works, the different participants of the network and what it means for decentralized application development. Hey guys, thanks for joining. Hey, how are you? Super exciting to be here. I'm trying to think when was my last podcast with Gil. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember. Pleasure to be here. Great to be here, guys. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Can you guys uh, just walk us through, like, what is the high-level vision of Lava? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, every great solution that started in the, wo in the world in general, especially in blockchain, had some uh, thesis behind that. And we jumped into, uh, into Lava about uh, two and a half years ago, almost three years. Uh, Gil was uh, developing MEV, NFT, uh, sniping, and you know, he, he dragged me in to jump into the rabbit hole. Uh, and we explored the, 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 the gap that there is about the RPC service that basically was rubbish and super unreliable. So we thought that you know, the most of the Web3 is the core data that at the end of the day, there are a few infrastructure providers there. So um, this is how Lava began. It began exactly how I mentioned before as the Uber for Node. So building a resilient, scalable, and decentralized RPC network that every developer can plug into and get service. Today, you can get this service from more under the 300 providers, and it's super reliable and super scalable. But that was two years ago. And we see that there was maybe a handful of different chains back then. Um, and since then, the Web3 evolved. You know, we, we've seen many different shaping events, kind of the, you know, the, the Luna crash. And today we have Bitcoin ETFs. We didn't think about that two years ago. So it, mean, it meant to us that the, the problems that back then developer had, um, today they are much more bigger. It's not only in the larger scale, but today they spread across of hundreds of different blockchains. So obviously the key innovation here uh, that enabled that is what we call uh, the modular blockchain. And modular blockchains were very interesting to me back then two years ago. I think uh, 
Mustafa mentioned that in his white paper, uh, Lazy Ledger, it called it uh, pluggable, maybe a less sexy name. But uh, today everyone talk about modularity, right? Uh, chain abstraction. And obviously the main thesis for now is building hundreds and thousands of blockchain. And this is what modularity will create over the very near future. And we've seen that there are three main layers for modular blockchain. You have the execution, execution la layer, you have the data availability and consensus layer, and you have the settlement layer. But as we see more and more blockchain, um, while Celestia, for example, made it 100x time easier to um, uh, roll up one, um, we think that there is a convergence in which every, every roll up, every L1, every layer that's going to come up, every blockchain that's going to come up will need. And this is the data access layer. It started with RPC and indexing. Um, you know, if for those here who doesn't know what's RPC, it's bas basically communication protocol in order to query data. Every time you open the MetaMask wallet, uh, making a transaction, basically it's an RPC request. Um, if you check the account balance, so MetaMask is querying the blockchain for that. Um, and today, in order to scale dApps over blockchain, they need to get access to data, right? But what's the point? What's the point of storing the Yeah, just jumping in a little bit. I'm curious, like, so there's a lot of, like, different things one could do in crypto, right? A lot of different business models, use cases. Like, what was it about this particular problem that, you know, you found so exciting? Like, why, why build this? Why not something else? Uh, it's really a great question, you know. When, we, when I started uh, in Web3, we were, like, doing MEV stuff, you know, writing bots to snipe tokens and to snipe NFTs. And some other really cool stuff and it was a huge struggle to just have the nodes right so if you were trying back then to get the data to run all these operations you needed to uh either use like centralized providers like in or alchemy which sometimes were just very slow it's just not fast enough for this type of operation but you also weren't sure that the data is up to date like that you're getting the latest block and this is you know what makes or breaks a trade it's super critical for uh, for the bot to have the latest data. So we started with that. So I was running some bots, you know, I was running some nodes here uh, next to me. I had some machines running some nodes. And then I wanted to do the same thing on Polygon, right? So I was like, okay, now I need to run Heimdall and, you know, I need to run Bohr. I need to run more and more nodes. And then I want to do it on Avalanche, you know, and it just became such a struggle. And I realized, you know, this is not scalable. There's no way that I can keep, you know, writing and running all the services myself in a way that's scalable and performant. And I think this is, I think this is one of the core problems in Web3. If you take it out into the bigger picture in which is just fragmentation, every single blockchain, every rollup, they have their own concepts, they have their own data uh, access and this creates this huge uh, user experience uh, problem for everybody. If it's like, let's say you want to trade on a, on a wallet, you know, you're getting an airdrop from somebody. You have to get another wallet, another wallet. You have to figure out what gas token is being used. And I think this connects to their longer vision, you know. Yes, you have Celestia, you have Dimension. And then I think one of the key unlocks is having love on top of that. And then and making everything uh, connect all of those chains, they need access to the data. They're, they're useless without all these rollups on Eigenlayer, on, on Ethereum. And this is what we do, right? We're building this permissionless network that lets anyone join, give service to any of these blockchains in a very easy way. Uh, so I, th I think the long-term vision is like making all Web3 like a one a one or two or three, but top three, like super usable experiences. With RPC, I mean, today, right, like you described, I think the problem well, right? Like, okay, you want to do something on one chain and then you need this node and now another chain, you need another node. And of course this, yeah, like a lot of uh, projects, applications are struggling with this. And, uh, and so they... Like how, like pre-Lava, right? If we ignore Lava, like how are people 
um, or I mean, my understanding is right. They mostly use centralized providers like you know, Alchemy, QuickNotes, um, Chainstack, maybe Infura, things like that. How would you rate the quality of those products? Like, what is the what sort of the weaknesses and problems with the centralized RPC providers? So I think some of them provide amazing service. You know, I think they optimized the service very well. For example, Alchemy on, on Ethereum is really good. You know, QuickNote is really good service. Infura is, is a pretty decent service as well. So I think that there are trade-offs uh, to be to talk about. But if you look at the numbers of supported chains, they're very small because it's very hard to optimize for many, many chains. And you might be a champion or like provide the best infrastructure for a single chain and like write your own layer of caching and optimizations to make very make it very cost efficient and fast. But to scale it up to many chains, and this comes back to the core issue, you need to be a, a, an expert in that specific chain. And this is where Lava is different. First, it's not just one provider. It can be Infura, QuickNode, and Alchemy, all competing. It's like a death match. Like imagine like all the bots are fighting. Who's giving the best service? And in the end, you have like, the few champions are getting the belts. And this is what Lava is like. It's a competition between the providers to give the best service. So in every single chain, you have this competition. And whoever comes up with the brightest, uh, you know, most unique, most novel uh, way to optimize wins. Uh, and that translates to really good user experience for the user and the most reward for that provider. So it kind of makes sense. Okay, yeah, thanks so much, Gil. That was very helpful. So basically, is you feel like one of the main value propositions is that the centralized RPC providers, they can only cover sort of a limited amount of networks and they're going to have a hard time scaling that up. Uh, maybe especially if you see like a big increase in the number of chains and then with Lava, you can have a sort of uniform uh, like developer experience uniform way to integrate rpcs across you know like all the different chains and because then you can have different providers basically sort of together providing a service and some focusing on different chains so it'll be, of course be way easier to scale to like you know support a much larger number of chains exactly like lava is like a distribution channel for these providers think about it that way they can write the best code uh, run the best operation and infrastructure and then they compete on this battleground and in the end they get all the users the best ones so they're able to iterate they're able to innovate they're able to build the best uh, data access uh, you know capabilities and then they can win and get more rewards and this is real time so over time they they can um, get better or get worse versus their uh, opponents I guess the big question that comes up for me here, and I think that maybe ties sort of in the next topic, if you actually want to go a bit deeper in here, is I guess one of the, I mean, I understand the downside of the centralized RPC providers, but of course the upside is there's like a company and I can sign an SLA and they're going to have a support thing and I get to call them up and, 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 you know, I can probably expect a pretty consistent level of service. Whereas here, if you have like all kinds of different operators for different chains, different, you know, maybe big companies, small companies, how, how does that work in terms of the quality of service being provided? It's a really good question, right? So, so I'll just say quality of service is like at the core of what we've built at Lava. We spent so much time and energy and effort into ensuring that the quality of service is, is top notch. And I think it really is on Lava, and I think it's only going to get better. Uh, it's got, it's, I think it's going to crush everybody else. Uh, just because we, we designed it from the ground up in such a way that the users are actually the ones rating the provider based on their experience. But I also want to touch on your question about SLAs, you know, signing contracts, because I think these are really, really important. And also support. Support is critical. You know, we spoke, we speak with, last year I think we spoke with approximately a thousand projects. Uh, you know, from dApps to chains to ecosystems and getting their uh, feedback on, you know, what, what do they need? You know, how is, what, what are they not happy right now with their infrastructure? And support is critical for them. 
So the way I see it, you know, in this in this world of Web3, there has to be a way to build a business that also supports the ecosystem that it serves. And the way I see it, maybe it's very similar to the Red Hat uh, Foundation, for example, where you have this open source project or like you have the, the Lava Network, and then you have this company or multiple companies that basically provide support for customers about, via onboarding them through gateways. So they can use the gateways, they can pay for these gateways, the clients also pay on chain for the service, but they get the support package, they get the SLAs, and they get all of these enterprise features. Maybe it's on uh, SOC certification uh, so that they can operate under the standards that they need to. So I think these are th these are two answers. And can you explain what gateways are? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't touch on that. But basically, when you use Lava and we built it like this, because we thought this is the best way to to provide you know really good quality service to everybody. Uh, when you use Lava, you don't have to go through any central server. So think about um, you know centralized servers as basically like a middleman that sits between you and the, and the data that you want. And this middleman is basically uh, you're going to it and it's going to get the data for you and then it brings it back to you. Uh, in Lava, we built it in a way in such you talk directly to the providers. So there's no middleman. You directly go to them, you get the data. A gateway is uh, a middleman like that, only it enables uh, easier access to the data by providing support and SLAs and everything that you mentioned. It's funny, Brian, when you were asking about uh, whether you know you could, well, when you were comparing to, uh, to centralized providers and you were saying, that with a centralized provider, you have this SLA and you can call them up and whatever. I just couldn't help but think, well, isn't, I mean, that's the same for your bank and you still use blockchains and crypto, right? I mean, you know, this, this extends to the broader, you know, the broader crypto space, I think. And, uh, and yeah, so it was just like a, a sort of funny remark there. You're just using web two tools in order to, uh, operate in web three. And, you know, for us, it didn't make sense in the beginning. And in order to scale, you know, to, to cause the, the billion dApps and uh, people like onboarding on Web3, um, we need the scalability infra. Yeah, no, I, I think that answer makes sense. I mean, I, I guess one thing, the other thing that comes to my mind here is, of course, we've, ha we've also seen some decentralized projects actually doing like an okay job, my understanding, or maybe, maybe even good job at support. I think Osmosis is like an example, right? Where they use the community pool to like fund teams to, you know, deal with support requests and generally have heard like good feedback that seems to be working pretty well. Um, but yeah, the gateway thing also makes sense. So basically then I would... Uh, yeah, like let's say as a as an operator or like as someone needing RPC, I sign some contract, and then I can all you know always query. Basically, all the requests get routed through that gateway node, and then uh, they can like let's say track uptime, and if there are issues, they troubleshoot it, and maybe I can pay them with dollars a credit card and they pay because because in the end the operators would get paid on chain using lava tokens or like how do the payments work to the operators so yeah so the way it would work and i think you know the gateway concept is an open gateway you know anyone can talk to the foundation put up a governance proposal and start operating gateway the, the, but the important part uh and this is also touching on uh, seb's points i think is which is interesting is that um, it's it's done in a way that is also familiar to the customer. I think this is in general a, a way that you know Web three projects need to be able to um, to give answers to Web two type customers. I think it's I think it's crucial. In the end, you want to operate with many many different companies that want to use the service, and they need some sort of a gateway, right, to get familiar with it because they don't know how to buy tokens and go on chain and buy a subscription on Lava. So maybe it's easier for the first step for them is to pay this type of gateway operator uh, to buy for them and then give them the service. Uh, and then the operator you know, goes buy tokens, goes on chain, buys it for them with some kind of referral code. And this is how it works. Uh, and this referral code basically gives that 
provider a portion, whatever he agreed with the governance, to now operate this contract. So say you want to buy the service, you come to this operator, you pay, let's say, 100 lava, uh, he goes on chain, he buys it for you, and he takes a 20% cut, and then with this 20%, he operates, you know, the servers, uh, he operates the support center, uh, he offers SLAs, he does audits, and gives you the convenience that you need for a Web2 project. But if you're a fully Web3 project, you don't need any of that crap, you can just go on chain, you can buy the subscription with tokens, and you don't need to talk to anybody or go through any governance or go through anything else. Let's go a little bit under the hood here. I'd, I'd love to get a better understanding of like what the network topology looks like. So, you know, we talked about um, some of the, like the, the, these operators, but what are the, all of the roles in the network and how are they interacting with each other? And I think importantly, how are they interacting with applications? So I think one of the, you know, the core principles that guided us when thinking about Lava, and by the way, we are Lava protocol. So the, you know, the core contributors to the Lava network um, was to keep it simple, right? We have three different actors, main actors on the chain. We have the dApps buying on-chain subscription. We have the provider staking Lava uh, in order to participate. And we have the validators that keeping, um, you know, keeping the service uh, running. And um, down into that, we see that node provider, node provider serving data modules that they uh, call specs. And those specs are being defined by the champions that Gil mentioned before. Uh, champion can be anyone from any chain, whether it's a small upcoming rollup or it's a huge ex existing chain, it doesn't matter. But uh, just coming up with the governance proposal in order to define this spec, um, actually is creating this unique spec that the uh, dApps can afterward use. So these dApps and consumer, they using this um, data and they being paired off with the uh, off-chain peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication protocol directly to the uh, provider themselves. So imagine that, that from the browser, you can get a list of top providers and receive service. When Gil mentioned before, we were speaking with more than thousands of projects this year. They constantly um, refer back and told us about the problems that they're having. They are, they're using centralized provider and usually not once, but then they need to come up with node balancing, with disaster recovery, with all of these different uh, things that as a small DAP, they don't need to do. So the Lava taking this burden away from them and imp implementing that and give them 99.999 availability of the service. After the service has been done, um, the DAP signing the transaction and uh, sending back all the different parameters about the service. So availability, the reliability of the service, the, the accuracy. And this is made, this is uh, being used for the score to score, again, the provider for them to get more and more service. Um, that's in general the different actors on the chain. So just one thing, you know, think about the blockchain like a, a restaurant and think about specs as like uh, the menu at the restaurant, right? So the menu of the restaurant tells the people who come to eat, this is what you can have. You can have this type of salad or this type of soup or entree, uh, and this is what specs are. Um, so for every chain, you have these these different menus, right? Uh, and the way we see it is that, you know, any chain that is launching an OP stack, uh, you know, like Blast or any other ones, or any chain that is launching on Dimension, for example, any rollup that is launching on Dimension or Arbitra, they can immediately, this is the vision, um, as part of the launch, you know, propose this spec on chain, this menu that immediately you have all these, you know, hundreds of providers who well, this is their job, this is their bread and butter. They come in and they're like, we're going to run nodes for this. We think this is going to, you know, give us a lot of rewards. They go ahead and run nodes. Then you have, you have this amazing network of node operators giving all of these customers the best service. One thing that, you know, always happens and we see it every single time, I think everybody's going to agree with me, as soon as there's like an airdrop or there's like a testnet being launched that people start, you know, farming or playing with, 
the first thing that happens is the RPC crashes and collapses. We see it every single time. Uh, so this is where like Lava can completely shine and take over all this usage uh, and scale really easily. So I want to talk a bit more about this this spec uh, concept. So a, a spec is a, a document or specification that a, a, a chain or project will put forth and then it specifies, as a specification does, um, what data to provide. Does it also specify like how to, in the case of an indexer, for example, let's say we need to um, fetch like some time weighted average price of uh, like some 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 um, some price um, or like some complex data feed that requires some complex calculations about like pricing data that, that is found on chain does the spec also specify how to arrive at that result so that it can be displayed you know, in the application in the front end and I think importantly what is the method by which you know this val this data is verified and validated uh, in order to maintain like accuracy of the data that's provided uh, that's a really good question because um yes it so the spec it defines as you've said what type of data you can get like a restaurant like a menu at the restaurant okay you can get the soup but you want the soup without you want the salad but you don't want uh the dressing you want it on the side right so the spec would specify you can oh can you get the dressing on the side can you remove the onions I'm gonna have a steak. You're gonna have a steak, uh, okay. if you don't mind. Yeah. So, what's your, uh, you know, what? How would you like it cooked? Medium well. So, this is what the spec uh, specifies, right? It does not specify. It does not go into the kitchen and tells the uh, chef, "Oh, make it like this or make it like that," right? This is something the spec does not. Do. This is the burden of the developers that are building the chain. So, they're building the way to actually uh, go and get the steak, make the steak, uh, where to get it from one supplier. What it does do with the menu, it does tell you what the steak is, right? Is this a Wagyu A5 or are you getting some, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, low rate? So this does define the, the quality, right? So these are, I hope, I hope it explains it well. Uh, I think it's a really cool concept. Uh, so I'm curious. So I, I mean, in the case of IPC, then that maybe it's like, slightly less relevant i imagine no because like you have like a chain has this like rpc spec or or like maybe but it's like you know it's, it's basically like rpc node for like a particular chain is i imagine going to be pretty uniform but i guess um i wonder is that where this sort of api concept comes in as well where someone can make uh you know a spec for something like you know that you cannot get from a normal rpc node and yeah, maybe can you talk a little bit about sort of beyond RPCs and especially like how Lava can be used to provide APIs? Yeah, so first it's not uniform at all. At all. <laughs> Ryan, it's completely, any every single Cosmos chain, for example, has like a different uh, variations and add-ons and every one of them has a different versions of, Co of Cosmos SDK. Okay, so every version has a different spec. So it's not, it's super fragmented. This is why RPC is difficult. That's why it's tough to get right. This is why we've built it in such a modular way. Um, the second thing that is important before I get to API is that a spec also allows you to specify validations, which is like, how many blocks are you expected to get? Because a lot of our uh, customers, they want to get, you know, they want to index the whole blockchain from, from block zero. For that, you need to store on many chains, you know, 10 terabytes, 12, 20 terabytes, maybe even more in some chains. This is a huge burden. Obviously, not all, every operator can uh, could do that, right? So this is why we have these types of validations uh, and extensions. So an extension allows you to say, you know, I'm offering, uh, you know, the latest data for the last two weeks, whatever, however many blocks it is. Or you could say I'm an archive node. You know, I have the storage and ca capabilities, but I expect to get paid five times for archive data because I am taking a bigger burden. To touch on APIs, um, so yes, the, the way we've built um, specs uh, is a way that allows anyone to write uh, the spec in a way that is is uh, supporting of APIs like indexing, like subgraphs, any types of APIs. 
So you can go and write uh, a spec that gives you access. And we're working on partnerships with uh, different uh, indexing uh, projects like Subsquid, for example, um, that that you basically you know copy paste the subgraph, uh, run it on faster infrastructure, faster indexing uh, using uh, Lava and Subsquid, and still get all the uh, the many providers, um, quality of service, and the uh, the data reliability. So we, we touched briefly on the quality of service aspect, which is like very important in the context of RPC uh, and, and data provisioning. How Can you go into detail about how the quality of service algorithm works and how do, do users uh, that are you know pinging RPCs know that they're going to get a good quality RPC provider or indexer? Yeah, well, you know, we went to great lengths to make sure that the, the service is really top notch. Uh, we really did. Uh, and it starts from the from the beginning. Uh, basically, how do you choose the provider? So you choose the provider based on how much money, how much stake they have in the system. So the more stake they have, the more likely that they will be in your pairing list. Pairing list is the list of providers that you can use. Once you have this list, you can talk to any of these providers. So we've written this very complex <laughs> engineering feat we call the, ARP, the uh, provider optimizer. It's, it's, by the way, everything is seamless. For you, it's just like using a regular RPC. So the RPC, uh, the provider optimizer, is basically uh, like a friend that goes and checks every provider. Give me the latest block, give me the latest block. Whoever is the fastest and has the most uh, relevant, fresh information, like the, the latest block, so that you're not looking at all data, it basically saves them at the top of the list. And then when you get the data, you're talking to them. So let's say you have all these providers, uh, you're in Europe, right? So someone uh, in you know Central Europe has a server, and he's really really fast. You're gonna be talking to that. So this is what the RPC, uh, op- the provider optimizer, does. Now, as you talk to him, you start writing down. Okay, this guy, okay, is giving me you know it's fast, it's slow. Oh, here he was you know he was uh, not as fast as I expected. Yeah, I moved to somebody else. You write these uh, report cards. You save them, and then you send them, um, and then they get on-chain from these providers. There's a process, I won't get into it. Uh, these report cards go on-chain, and they affect um, the provider's uh, payout, basically. So the provider has uh, an incentive to always provide really good service, So, but it doesn't affect the whole payout. Um, on top of that, we have what we call excellence quality of service. And this is the same report cards over time. They accumulate on chain and they are saved uh, in this, this provider's profile. So this is like a way to build a reputation for a provider on chain. Um, and then the last step, hope not, so, not too much, the excellence quality of service score, the reputation for this provider is also uh, one of the factors that affects its sparing list. So go back to the first step. It's how much money is staking. Because if he stakes a lot of money, saying, I'm serious, I'm here, I can handle your requests. Uh, and then over time, how good were you? And we have all these customers that are paying and they're using their uh, you know, payouts basically to score. If you go back to the menu example, it's like you have TripAdvisor connected directly with the, um, uh, with the menu itself. So it gives you constant feedbacks for the meal you just ate, but it's built in. You don't need afterwards to get something. Everything is happening on chain. Okay. And so users are rating the the service providers. It, 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 it is the end user, like the guy who's doing the transaction in MetaMask you know, on Uniswap or whatever application is using Lava that is doing this rating or is it the developers? Yeah, it's, it's when you say doing... That's that's an interesting way because everything is happening automatically, right? So during the transaction, we are aggregating all the different parameters about the scalability, the freshness of the data. So those are being used in order to score the existing tra- uh, transaction, the existing session with the provider. And during during the lifespan, obviously, the scoring change according to the service they they give. So how does that work if, if the actual service is provided like peer-to-peer without 
some node in between like how how would you how do you even have that information that's that's really good question i think it's and it's a, a bit complex just because of how the protocol is working and i think you know this is where the gateways come in and this is where the sdk comes in so as i've said in the beginning you know you can use lava without any central uh, middleman to do that you can use the sdk or you can run your own gateway right and this is all open source the other way is if you use a gateway if you use a gateway, then the gateway basically scores for you. Okay, so this is how it works. Now, the spec that we talked about, which is like one of the core components of Lava, is basically uh, defining the communication between the consumer and the, and the provider. So actually, there's a, there's a protocol, there's a network protocol that wraps the actual RPC query with everything we just spoke about. So it's like a channel between the consumer and the provider with everything, the rating, uh, the quality of service, the uh, conflict detection, which we didn't talk about, but it's a way to ensure that the data is accurate as well. Cool. And how does the pricing work here? How is it determined, you know, how much these services cost? You know, at the beginning, we uh, were always giving this answer that, you know, ask us how, how come you were coming up with this good service. And basically, we said we took all the top centralized provider pricing list, put it into the chat GPT came up with a better price. But the thing behind Lava is the, um, um, that it's a real economy, right? It's a real market that's going to balance between the supply and demand. So if you start with a certain price, it can go up and down based on the demand. So I, get, I can give you an example. If there is a, you know, a service, an NFT drop that's being given in a, a, like a place that there are not many supply, obviously the price is going to go up and going to um, going to invite more and more providers. Let's say uh, you know suddenly the, there is um, you know NFT drop and a need in, in Africa or South Africa or something, and you have only two providers there. So obviously the the demand upon the drop going to be higher and higher again, and this is how we balancing the the protocol is automatically balancing the supply and demand mechanism. I'll just add that even though we're, you know, we've been running in testnet, we've already signed contracts with uh, ecosystems uh, and these ecosystems have, have distributed tens of thousands of dollars to providers. Uh, this has already been done and there's hundreds of thousands more that are going to be signed and distributed uh, in this year. So I think, you know, it's already showing its, uh, Love is already showing stability to really support uh, different blockchains. And to touch on the pricing, uh, as Eric said, for, for ecosystems, today, you know, the way it works is they go to, let's say, one of the big centralized providers and they sign a contract. This contract can be for a whole year, can be for multiple years. And this contract uh, locks them in to a certain price. And one of the complaints we've heard from them is that they don't want to be locked in because sometimes uh, the market is not active. And sometimes the market is really active. So they want to be able to balance the payouts to these uh, node runners based on the demand. And I think it makes complete sense, right? It's like a pay as you go. So it's the most, way, it's the most efficient way to, to, to pay providers. So this is what we've built in Love. So these ecosystems like Evmos, like XLR, uh, like Near, and, and many others that are signing uh, and have signed already, they are able to set their own budget. They're saying, this month or next three months, I'm going to put, let's say, uh, 10,000 Lava tokens in the uh, in the pool, on chain, in this, on the spec, on the menu. And then all the providers know, this month, you're getting 10,000. So they can decide, is this worth enough? They're, okay, there's 1,000 providers. Does it make sense for me to join? Maybe not. Okay, there's 20 providers. Does it make sense for me to join? Yes, hell yeah. You know, if I'm good, I can get a really good share of the pie. And this is why it's a dynamic market. Interesting. Yeah, so so there is this kind of like uh, market equilibrium that, you know, you hope to achieve here uh, depending on like demand and, uh, you know, how well networks are being served. Is this something you've already demonstrated with the networks on which uh, you've been, you've been, working with like that data providers sort of rearrange and reposition themselves on particular networks when 
demand is higher and retract when demand is lower? We've been able to demonstrate that using Lava, you, you're able to give an ex excellent top-notch service of RPC and attract many providers. Um, but the payout has been constant. In the near future, as we launch Mainnet, I believe this is going to change and it's going to be much more dynamic. But it's a process that will happen over time. We are seeing that, and this is already live on testnet, uh, that these rewards, they make sense for providers to run and give really good service. We've we've received uh, a lot of praise for uh, the different services we're offering to these ecosystems. And uh, we're seeing inbound from other chains that have recently launched testnets and have been struggling. Uh, they're reaching out to us asking, can we, can we use the same incentivization model to bring in more providers for our network? So we're definitely seeing it uh, taking off. Yeah, and I think it bears uh, reminding people that Lava has been in testnet for a while, but that it, it's actually like working with live chains. So even though the network is in testnet, all of the data providers are actually providing like real data. And um, there's something like 30 or 35 networks currently live on Lava, correct? Yeah, it's a production grade system right right now, uh, like for for one year. And I just want to touch upon the previous, um, you know, what brought us to ecosystem because Lava started as a decentralized service, and today everyone is talking about decentralized RPC service. Um, but then we got approaches by ecosystem to solve and take away the burden of public RPC because public RPC is the first stop of every dev into the ecosystem. So if the ecosystem is able to provide uh, a scalable service, RPC, and then APIs and solve of these um, you know, headaches of how do they accessing data for uh, different apps, it goes without saying. So ecosystem came back to us and told us, can Lava actually provide this public RPC? Can, they give, can you give us insight into the ecosystem? And... Um, Obviously, we jumped into that and we presented in October, first time, the incentivized public RPC. When uh, the ecosystem put in incentives for different providers to join permissionlessly and get reward for the service they give. And we started doing that in Evmos and afterward in Axelar, we just announced Near. And all of this distribution of the different rewards being, being done only in the last few months. So working on three different chains. So in the pipeline, we have now uh, from Filecoin, Starknet, Koi, Agoric, and more are coming to level. Okay, very cool. One thing I wanted to inquire about as well is relayers. So one of the issues, you know, particularly in Cosmos chains, is that like relayers are not incentivized for their work. Does Lava facilitate um, the matching of, you know, chains and relayers as well, or is that completely outside of the scope? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of discussions around IBC uh, and its fundamental design. And I think, you know, IBC has been an incredible protocol that really puts, you know, Cosmos lights here ahead of any other uh, ecosystem. Uh, but in at its core, there's a core issue with payments for relayers. And I think that we will definitely be able to see Lava help with that. Right now, our focus is launching mainnet, you know, bringing the power of, of um, you know, the modular uh, unlock that we can do with Lava to to chains and rollups, you know, that are built on Eigenlayer, on Ethereum, uh, on Dimension. But for sure, you know, once we're, you know, we're more, um, we're done with that, we'll definitely be able to help with, uh, relayers and, and try to solve core issues like that in the Cosmos ecosystem as well. So you mentioned modular again, yeah, you mentioned it earlier. So of course I understand that, you know, for also modular chains, rollups, well, you still need RPC, you still need this thing. So I understand how like, you know, the, you know, Lava stack is still, is still relevant in that kind of modular world, but I'm curious is. Is there more to this or um, w what do you see as sort of the connection between Lava and modular chains? If you look at, you know, Web3, right? If you look at 
what's happening today, I think that everyone's coming to the same conclusion, right? There's going to be an explosion of chains, but how many uh, chains are going to be like uh, full purpose, uh, not specific purpose, uh, like if you're in full purpose, you know, you can run anything you want, smart contract, or you have application specific ones on Cosmos or rollups. Uh, so I think, um, I think it's pretty obvious that in the future, we're going to have all these chains and they're going to explode. They're going to be super successful, but how do you weave one path through all of them? It's super difficult and, and it sucks. I mean, it sucks today trying to use all of these chains. It sucks. It's really, it's really difficult. Even for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a tech user. I consider myself a power user. It's difficult for me to keep track of all the chains and all of my assets across all of them and to interact with them and, and bridge tokens and make sure I'm using the right bridge and don't get hacked. Until we solve these core issues, we're not going to have a good, a good system. And one of the things that we're seeing prop up, and I've been thinking about it a lot, is how do you, like, imagine the future of Web3. You have one wallet, and it has access to all of the chains, and it shows you the assets on all of your chains. And you don't care where your assets are. You don't care if they're, you know, on, on uh, you know, Cosmos Hub. You don't care if the, the assets are on Ethereum, on Arbitrum. You don't care where they are. They're just there. And you want to move them somewhere? No problem. You don't need to think about, wait, do I have uh, Osmosis, Osmo token to perform the trade, to do, to move the tokens? Or do I have this token or that token? Or start thinking about the gas. You know, so I think the future of Web3 is some kind of system that allows, you know, for full chain abstraction. For, so you don't even think, you don't know what a bridge is. You don't know what gas is. This is the only way to reach mass adoption, which I think is the goal of what we're doing here. And when we were thinking about Lava, we were thinking about modularity, we were thinking, how can Lava be one of these core um, key unlocks in this in this stack? And we see that, you know, okay, there's RPC, we can talk about RPC all day, but it's really, really boring. But you have to do it really well. But then you have to be able to launch it really fast for all of these chains. But what if you could, on top of the RPC and on top of the APIs, use this now network that has basically stakes from every single ecosystem. And all these uh, providers are now staked to verify that the data is correct on Lava. What if you're able to use that to build some uh, chain abstraction that enables you to you know, more freely uh, move assets around, um, you know, access uh, all the different blockchains without even knowing, and still trusting that the data is correct, still have, have everything decentralized. So this is what we're trying to think of, of the grander vision of uh, of chain abstraction and uh, how Lava fits in and unlocks this. If I add on top of that, you know, what you said before, when describing like, doesn't matter if you take the monolithic path thesis, right? The, the modular blockchain, or if you go to the rollup centric, all of them need the data access layer. If you give devs, devs the, the right tools to build the, the infrastructure, if you build them, if you take the burden away from them, from whatever they're building, this will scale the industry. And Seb, you mentioned before the, the banks, right? So if there is a, two providers that you go for them for the data and, and two of them is down, how are you going to get access to your MetaMask? How you can promise your users as a wallet that they can make transactions? All of that, we believe with this modular layer, it's something that Lava is able, able to save. And we call it a build whatever, wherever. Build whatever it's, you build it, whatever you want, whatever adapts, not focusing on the infra. And wherever is in the multi-chain. So can you guys talk about Magma? Yes, of course. Uh, Magma is a super exciting confidential project that's... Uh, not anymore. Gonna lie. <laughs> Ah, sorry, but it's not live, right? Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna, yeah, it's gonna, we're gonna announce it uh, uh, on the fifteenth of uh, of uh, February, and this is basically brings a non-technical users, all of us that have a wallet, to share the the Lava vision, to share the Web three values. The Magma is the point system that Lava is uh, presenting. It allows any user to use the Lava endpoints, chain that 
at the back end of the wallet in order to get access that is super available, it's uh, decentralized, and obviously it's, it's scalable. Um, so basically, jumping quickly into the magma, magma is the phase coming always before the lava. And we already announced that the mainnet is going to come up soon. Uh, magma point system is uh, a sign. Uh, it's a program that every every uh, use every user that has a wallet can sign up and uh, start receiving points for the um, the usage you do with the wallet. For transaction, you get scores. For just watching the wallet, it um, also create creates points. And because all of them is at the core that making RPC request, and every RPC request is being scored for you as a as a, as a user, and you can watch it over the lead port. Cool. And so, uh, which brings me to my next question: When mainnet? Mainnet. You know, our engineers working around the clock in order to address the mainnet. Um, uh, we are trying to push for. Uh, end of Q1. And uh, yeah, this is a super exciting times. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Very cool. And so where where should people go if, well, I guess there's a couple of things, right? If you're building an application and uh, want to integrate Lava to provide RPC to your users, like there's like one category of people that um, should check out Lava. But also if you're an infrastructure provider, uh, and want to provide infrastructure for the Lava Network, uh, where should these categories of uh, listeners go to? So I think uh, the team did a great job writing the, docu- the, the documentation. Uh, we have an amazing Discord channel with thousands of members, very vibrant, uh, and uh, always asking questions, getting, g- getting them answered by the community themselves for the new users. Um, so start with uh, our website, lavanet.xyz. Um, you can see there a lot of documentation and uh, jump into our Discord. We call also the non-crypto, non-tech users to amplify and bring more of the values of, uh, of Lava. Uh, in the upcoming months, um, the foundation will reach out and uh, you know, present different programs. And we all start uh, tomorrow or the fifteenth of uh, ter- of uh, February with the magma with the magma program. Cool. Well, thank you so thank you so much for coming on. Actually, I just wanted to mention one thing, which I think we should have mentioned at the start, but we forgot. So uh, you know, as most of you know, my main thing is running Course One, and with Course One, we did invest in Lava, and we we're running a validator, and I think Seb with his fund also invested in Lava. So we just wanted to mentioned that yes and rough ventures are also investors in lava so full disclosure and running validators uh cool well thanks so much guys for coming on that was super interesting uh i think it's definitely something that i could see getting a lot of traction right and uh, it will be really great to see how this sort of things evolve once mainnet is live and uh you know over the next year so thanks so much for coming on guys thank you so much pleasure being here Cheers.